Well, welcome to worship with Valley United Methodist Church for July 12, 2020, the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. Glad you are with us this morning, whether in person or via Zoom. Have you joined me in an opening prayer? Life-giving God, you have called us to the fountain of new life, new vision, new hope, new fellowship with you and with one another. We come rejoicing. You have kept your promise. Faithful God, you promised never to leave us or forsake us. We come in victory. You kept your promise. All powerful, sustaining God, you promised to set us free from the law of sin and death. We come with hearts of thanksgiving and our minds are stayed on you because you kept your promise. Hallelujah. Our opening song is Living for Jesus, number 2149 in the Faith We Sing book. Our 
Our scripture reading this morning is from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of soulful flesh. And to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit My computer's trying to do something funny. Uh, according to the Spirit. But those who live according to the, to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It is not to submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit of life, be, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his Spirit that dwells in you. The title of my message this morning is Open Our Minds. And I've been going a couple different directions with this. I was working on this in one way, and the Spirit was whispering things to me this morning about this passage. Really, it's opening our minds to the Spirit. This passage starts with a wonderful phrase. The very first phrase in that scripture, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. We don't always get things right. We struggle. Last week, we talked about how Paul said, the things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, I do. The struggle with the flesh. This continues that passage. So the wonderful part of the Christian gospel is that there's nothing in our lives that we've ever done that God can't forgive. God is the one who sets us free from the life of sin and death. God's grace and love for us is beyond comprehension. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our liberation from the wrongs of our past comes through the death and resurrection of Christ. The mistakes of our past no longer have any power over us because we've been set free by his saving work. Paul expands this in verse 3. For while it was impossible of the law in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent his own son. Paul is reminding us that the Jewish law was never meant to bring us salvation. In fact, it is impossible that the law could ever bring salvation. God did not give the law to save, but to reveal our need for grace. So the problem isn't really inherent with the law. It was not the fault of the law that it couldn't save, but because we are weak in our flesh, in our emotions and our desires. It's the interaction of the law with our broken humanity that makes it impossible for, for salvation, because our flesh is weak. Hence, Paul saying, what I want to do, I cannot do. God has redeemed our humanity through the humanity of Christ, who lived among us, died, and was raised from the dead. Jesus has saved us. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In verse 4, he outlines the end result of that. In order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, 
who walk not in accordance with the flesh, but in accordance with the spirit. That was the purpose of God sending his son. So that when we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, we are not condemned to an endless cycle of making the same mistakes, but we can move into a more positive future with God. Now, Paul isn't saying that we're never going to make a mistake and we're never going to sin again. Of course we will. Because we're still frail human people. But Paul is referring for our motivation, the direction in which we're walking. In Methodism, we refer to that as the moving towards perfection or walking towards perfection. It's what we strive for. We still get it wrong. But our general motivation and desire is to walk in accordance with the spirit, not in accordance with the flesh. And then Paul does a lot of talking about the spirit and the flesh in the next several verses. He says, because the way of thinking of the flesh is hostility towards God, for it does not submit to the law of God. For Paul, the definition of being a Christian is someone who has the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. For Paul, if we are not living in the flesh, if, if we are of the flesh, primarily motivated by our own desires, we do not have the Spirit and we are not living the Christian life. But if we are of Christ, primarily motivated by a desire to walk with God. We do have the spirit and we are living the Christian life. We're moving towards perfection. So Paul works towards the conclusion of his, his argument in verse 10 and verse 11. In verse 11, he says, but on the condition that the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will give you life to your mortal bodies as well through his spirit which dwells in you. That's the eternal promise. But just as God raised Jesus from the dead, so we too will experience resurrection through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the resurrection body, all the tensions we experience in this life will be gone, and we no longer will be torn between spirit and flesh as we are now. And as I was contemplating this, this is where spirit really spoke to my heart this morning. And I was looking at um, a question. And the question is, can you sum up the Bible or the Christian faith? Can you sum up the Christian faith in one sentence? What do you think? Can you sum up the Christian faith in one sentence? It's hard, isn't it, to think about the, the, the Christian faith seems so complicated and so large to not be able to do that in one sentence. Living for Jesus, the life that is true, the song we just sang. Yeah. Well, there's a story um, that, yeah, that was told about a, a play um, that has a character called Hedda Gabler a newlywed who just returned from her honeymoon with her husband, George, with a newly minted PhD. Expecting a plum appointment at a local university, finds herself situated in a large new house ready to be furnished with whatever furniture she fancies. George is clearly infatuated with this beautiful new wife, whom everyone describes, to her increasing annoyance, as glowing. But appearances are deceiving. Only a few minutes into the play, we find that Hedda is complicated to the core. Another short essay in the program reports that Hedda has been, has been described as sinister, degenerate, repellent, repellent, lunatic, a monster in the shape of a woman, with a soul too small even for human sin. That's quite a writing, isn't it? But you realize if you're watching the play that Hedda is not necessarily a bad person bent on destruction of everything she touches. In this performance, she's brilliantly played with the energy of a trapped animal, like a tiger or a lion in a zoo cage, pacing back and forth restlessly, looking everywhere for a way to escape. So 
so we look at this passage that says that that says in here be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect and iris murdoch once commented that it would have made sense if the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had said something along the lines of, be ye therefore slightly improved. But he didn't. Instead, he said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So sometimes we try really, really hard, really, really hard to be perfect. And because we are frail human beings, we fail. We are like Paul. We struggle to do the things that we wish to do. So then, you know, then Paul cries out and says, who will rescue me? That was at the end of the passage that we talked about last week. And then that's with the beautiful verse at the beginning of this passage. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is the, that's the gift. We can't do it. We can't. Through Jesus Christ. Paul's expression of the Christian faith. That's how, that's Paul's one sentence summing up the Christian faith. Therefore, there is no condemnation. So here is another one that might, you might think about. This is one sentence that was given in answer to that question. God used to be angry with us, but God isn't angry with us anymore. That's the difference between a God of judgment and a God of love. I invite each of you to do the same. Think about what one sentence might sum up the Christian faith for you. What it means to be a follower of Jesus. So there's your, your spirit work for the week. Think about that one sentence that would summarize for you what the Christian faith is in one sentence. It says a lot about how highly God values and how much God loves each one of us. And I want to wrap up with a couple things from, um, from Richard Rohr. He had a, um, I get the, the daily contemplation emails from Richard Rohr every day. And some of them are really appropriate to what we're going through right now. We talk about struggling. So Richard Rohr says, for, the, for most people, the process begins on the side of action. We learn, we experiment, we do, we stumble, we fall, we break, and we find. Gradually, our thoughts and actions become more mature. But it is only when we begin to question our own viewing platform that we begin to move into the realm of contemplation. The contemplative side of the soul will reveal itself when we begin to ask, how can I listen for God and learn God's voice? How can I use my words and actions to expand and not contract? How can I keep my heart, mind, and soul open, even while it feels like I might be in hell on this earth? Contemplation is a way to bring heaven to earth, but it begins with a series of losses largely of our illusions. If we do not enter the learning process deeply with curiosity and openness, we will use our words and actions to defend ourselves. We will seek to protect ourselves from our shadow and build a, lead, a leaden cover over our soul and our unconsciousness. We will settle for being right instead of being whole and holy, for saying prayers instead of being prayers. We cannot grow in the great art form of action and contemplation without a strong tolerance for ambiguity, an ability to allow, forgive, and contain a certain degree of anxiety, and a willingness to not know and not even need to know. This is how we allow and encounter the mystery. It is a mystery. It's a mystery how there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because we don't see it necessarily on this earth. We struggle with it. You know, I don't know where you stand with some of those feelings around law 
and freedom. And certainly I know that this week I've been thinking a lot about that too. I've been thinking a lot about heaven and about how we tend to put markers and things that we say, well, this person's going to go to heaven and this one's not. And Linda and I watched uh, Heaven is for Real a couple days ago. And if you've seen that, you know the, the story of the young boy who went to heaven. Um, and he, um, nobody believed him. The adults didn't believe his story. And at the end, his father stands up and says, do you believe in heaven? He said, said two things. He said, you never have to apologize. He was talking to another person, or you never have to apologize for the brokenness that is inside of you. And then the other thing he said at the end of it was that his son saw heaven in a way that brings heaven to earth. And isn't that what we say? when we're talking about heaven as it is in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. And I think the challenge with Paul's passage here is that part of our work is bringing heaven to earth. And how do we do that? I think ultimately we have to do that because we rely on Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that lives in us. So therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So God's the one that has the last word. Whether we're living on this earth right now in what seems like hellish places or we're actually living in a place a little closer to heaven. So the challenge for us is to love God. And as John Wesley says, to move on towards perfection. So some things to think about. So you have your spirit work for the week. Come up with one sentence of how to describe the Christian faith. So next week, I won't be here for you to be able to share those, but maybe you can share those with Terry. What the one, what your one sentence is that helps describe the Christian faith. Thanks be to God. Amen. So my computer is trying to update in the middle of all this. Okay, there we go. Our call to response is spirit of gentleness. Number 2120 in your faith we sing. Open it. 
So what prayers do we have this morning? What prayers or praises? Michael? Uh, for Nick. Um, he's still up to do. He is in New York. He's loving it. But he says his heart is here because he has no place to live and no way to pay for it. Sure. Others? <clears throat> other praises, other prayers. Anybody online? You'll have to unmute yourself, uh, those that are online. I'd like to pray for my brother Lane, Dina's uncle, who passed on Friday, that all the family and Dina and I and Dan are comforted to know Lane is out of seven years of suffering from Parkinson's. Thank you for your prayers. So yes, prayers for myself and for our family, the Fuller family. My uncle Lane um, passed away on uh, Friday afternoon. Um, so just continued prayers for us and for the Fuller family in Florida. Um, the children that just lost their dad and a wife just lost a spouse. So yeah, prayers for them. Dorothy. Oh, okay. Pamela Chris, this is my daughter. She went in for a colostomy and she just woke up till six hours later. So she needs a little prayer support too. So for Pamela? Prayers for Pamela, who went in for a a procedure and then didn't wake up till several hours later, which is not normal for a procedure like that. Prayers for her. Any other prayers, any other praises? A season has gone well and no one's been hurt. Excellent. Chris, do you have anything? Chris and Dave? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, yeah. I would just like prayers for all of those, including myself, uh, facing life's challenges. For all of us who are facing life's challenges, including your, yourself. Yeah. Okay. We pray for Chris and for uh, anyone who's facing life's challenges right now. Any other prayers? Any other praises? 
All right, join me in an attitude of prayer. God of the universe, we come to worship this morning, longing to set our minds on the Holy Spirit, to live with Christ within us. We have not always made room for Christ in the clutter of our lives. We have indulged our wants so often that too often the voice of the Spirit is drowned out. As we rededicate ourselves to you this morning, may we live more in tune with the Spirit and use our resources in a way that reflects that Christ is Lord of our lives. Let's spend a moment in silent prayer. Let's pray the prayer together that Jesus taught us to pray. Uh, who lives in heaven. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For it is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So in preparation for our time of communion together, we're going to sing One Bread, One Body, number 620 in the hymnal.
we come to our time of communion. So for those of you that are here, you have your little cup. And the way that this works, when you, when you get to that point, the little, there's a little pink piece of paper on the top. That peels off to let you get to the wafer. And then the larger tab allows you to get to the juice. So that way you can keep it contained for yourself there. So join me in our time of communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing. Always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You took the dust of the earth and breathed your life into it, making humankind in your image. Because of this act of creation, your breath in our lives breathes in through our spirits. Everyone is of sacred worth. Yet from the very beginning of time, we have sought to tarnish that image. We have not seen each other with your eyes. We have not loved each other with your heart. When we have treated your sacred creation as unworthy, we not only sever our relationship with them, but also with you. Yet you continue to be faithful in loving us, faithful in sending your prophets throughout the ages to call us to repentance. And so with your people on earth and all the community of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy God, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. When we continue to worship our personal idols instead of you, you sent Jesus to teach us to love you with all we have and all we are, not just giving you a portion of our hearts, but instead inviting you to come in and completely transform us. When we continue to harm one another out of a desire to make ourselves appear more righteous, you sent us Jesus to teach us to sit and break bread together and love our neighbors as ourselves. And when we continue to choose fear instead of faith, hatred instead of love, Jesus went to the cross to show us what love ultimately looks like laying down your life for even those who do not love you in return. But that wasn't the end of the story. Three days later, Jesus rose from the grave to say that our hatred, our lack of love, does not have the final word. God's kingdom will triumph. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples. Yes, I miss the bread. When the supper was over, Jesus took the bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we come together as your people, your church, and offer our very selves into your hands in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, only made possible because of Christ's great sacrifice for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us anew this day and on this bread and juice. May they stand as tangible symbols for us of the love and new life you offer to us as you call us to a life of radiant grace. Bring us together, Lord, not despite our differences, but through them. As you weave us together as the beautiful body of Christ, may we joyfully serve beside our brothers and sisters in a way that reclaims the sacred worth and the breath of God that resides in us until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at that heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. 
All honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen. The body of Christ, broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. We come to our time of offering. And for those who are um, with us via Zoom, you can mail a check into our PO box. And for those that are here, we have our offering box down on the table down below here. And you can put your gifts in there. In this spirit of thanksgiving through the gifts that Christ has given us and we have given to him, let's stand in body and or spirit to sing together our doxology. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Praise God. Go ahead and have a seat. And join me in our benediction. Life-giving God, we have gathered in your presence to offer you thanksgiving and praise for all that you have done for us. Through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, we have been set free, free from the power of sin that leads to death, free to, to follow the leading of your Holy Spirit, free to love you with all of our heart and soul and strength, free to worship. May your Holy Spirit inspire our praise and our prayers, open our hearts and minds to your presence among us and within us, and to your word you speak, as you speak to us. To you alone, life-giving God, belongs all praise and honor and glory and blessing, now and to the end of time. Amen. And our closing song is Shine, Jesus, Shine, number 2173. In the faith we sing. If you want to stand for this, you're welcome. Lord Jesus, Lord, fill this place with the Father's glory. Please, 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 set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, walk our nations with grace and mercy. Stand for the world. Lord, and let them be long. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, 
trees and the seasons of your word. Lord, and let there be long. Lord, I come to your awesome presence from the shadows into your radiance. I bow lowly into your brightness. Let me try me consume all my darkness. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. As we gaze on your kingly brightness, so our faces display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirrored here, may our lives tell your story. Shine on me, shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Love the nations with grace and mercy. Sing for the word. Lord, and let there be And so this concludes our worship this morning. Thank you all for those who have joined us here and for those who have joined us via Zoom. Amen. Um, just could, could you take them with you and just throw them away? Yeah, I'm okay.